It's really great to see so many people out and so many people that I don't recognize. It's really exciting. Um, and tonight we're hoping to have a really fruitful discussion with the people in this room and with our guest, Manny Ness, who is um, a professor of political science at the Brooklyn College in, in New York City, part of the CUNY system, and also a, a longtime labor organizer and social movement activist, has been part of um, a New York Unemployed Workers Committee and the Lower East Side Labor and Community Coalition. Has done a lot of work with labor and community and organizing workers in, in various sectors. Um, Throughout the throughout the U.S., so it's, we're really privileged to have him come and speak to us tonight, and we're hoping that this won't just be your average lecture where somebody talks to you and then we ask questions, but rather that um, Manny's going to set up the basis for us to have a big and broad discussion about where we're at today in Toronto and in Canada and in the left in North America and how we can start to begin to build um, a working class fighting force in this country. So. Um, yeah, I just want to welcome Manny Ness, and thanks everyone for coming. Let's get started. Thank you. Anyway, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you, Elise, for saying those kind words. <laughs> um, I only wish that uh, many of the efforts that we've all engaged in over the years bear fruit uh, in the coming years, and that even if they fail, they're worthwhile to engage in. And so. Yeah, I'm going to have sort of an informal discussion, uh, make some key points that uh, I think are extremely important uh, for the particular juncture, uh, and um, start with uh, trying to situate uh, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy in general within a context of the current political economy in North America and globally in, in some way. And um, I feel like I, I was giving my marching orders uh, by uh, a number of you. Uh, and I felt that they're extremely important because we often talk about events as uh, situations that take place. Uh, you know, to use the de Borg's work, you know, like we're, in some ways, the situationists will say, well, this event just came and left. Uh, I think there's some truth to that in certain ways, but uh, I also feel that it would be a missed opportunity if we were to neglect uh, understanding the uh, forces that lead to events and also the way forward. And I think that's something that we all could lo uh, look at right now as we move toward a, a new uh, moment in, in, in this contemporary struggle. Um, so, I was just talking to uh, one of your colleagues, and, and actually that was part of the, the discussion, that over the last four or five years, uh, three or four decades, uh, unbeknownst to many of us, uh, we've had our standard of living, uh, our standard of living throughout the Americas, and including Europe, uh, and certainly the rest of the world, uh, decline uh, for the most part. Um, and that has, uh, you know, it started in the 1970s with the uh, end of steel, really, for North America, the creation of mini mills, the outsourcing of steel to Brazil, Korea, and other parts of the world, subsequently India and China and so forth, and uh, the outsourcing of automobiles and, and beyond. Um, and so this has had a profound effect on, on our standard of living. Now, I think that uh, those people who grew up in the baby boom generation and those people who grew up, who grew up in, uh, I guess, Generation X and now the new millennials um, have different perspectives. And I think we should, be re we should recognize what those perspectives were. Growing up at the end of the baby boom generation, my perspective was one of, well, a different type of experience, but it was one where, okay, things were only going to get better. For me, getting better was, I was watching the anti-war movement as a kid. I was watching uh, the civil rights movement as, a, as a, a kid, and I was extremely excited by it. And I thought, oh, okay, socialism is around the corner for us. Um, the next step will be uh, um, maybe, you know, so, uh, 
free health care in the United States. I mean, this is going to be uh, a, a movement where only progress will take place. But we know that, that that's not the case, and, and certainly uh, North the United States and also Canada. And uh, so we are now in 2012, having experienced a year of tremendous militancy on the part of students and workers and uh, people who are poor, the working class in general. Uh, I, just to look back at this generational point, that this generation afterward grew up uh, in hock, really. You know, people felt, you know, people were living under basically the same conditions as the preceding generation. Uh, they would have basically a house to live in, they would have a car, they would have education, enough food to eat, which now is actually a problem, uh, even for people in the global north. Uh, certainly we had ecological movements and so forth that were of importance, although that kind of was minimized in the 90s and so forth, where uh, people started to accept the idea of nuclear uh, uh, industry and so forth. Uh, so, um, uh, what is the crisis, and how can we uh, understand the crisis and seek ways to um, understand what the forces were that uh, built them? Well, certainly, the, the, those people who grew up now in the, those people who are the new millennials who grew up in the 1990s and 20, uh, first uh, decade of the 20th century, I tend, uh, tended to be less uh, well off than their preceding generation. Uh, yes, you had actually Keynesianism through the creation of what uh, is certainly a uh, process which leads to crisis, and that's a, pit, a process of booms and busts. And um, it starts under Reagan, and it continues under Bush, and it continues under Clinton, and then under Bush too. In this country, uh, the same kinds of processes uh, were in place. Uh, but in, in, uh, we can talk about China and the UK and other countries that kind of uh, were resigned to the norms of neoliberalism. Now, I don't see neoliberalism or what is referred to as globalization as uh, a separate process. It is a, an extension of the contemporary uh, phase of capitalism. Globalization in its current form is one that's highly related to financialization, highly related to speculation and so forth. Uh, and uh, as a consequence of this, uh, the ways in which the economy could support itself was through creating artifices, uh, through financialization primarily, uh, through the creation of the IT boom, uh, where people thought they were going to get extremely rich, um, even if they were marginally engaged in the IT industry. Uh, people who were working for Amazon.com, I, I remember in the late 90s I would go to uh, conferences on new media on the left, and uh, people were actually after the 2001 boom, saying, well, what did I think? You know, I thought I, I was worth you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, it doesn't make a difference, US or Canada, basically. And now I'm worth nothing. You know, I, I expected to get hundreds of thousands of dollars out of the kinds of money I, or the effort that I put in, worked effort, at, at, you know, many hours uh, and so forth. Uh, per day and per week and per year. People worked really hard and what they got for it was nothing actually in the end. And so a new boom was created with respect to housing and it was the financialization of virtually everything. Uh, what is referred to by David Harvey as uh, the accumulation by dispossession. That finan financialization did not only mean that people were going to get rich on their housing, it meant that they would take your house, uh, if you're poor or working class, and turn it into a commodity or ensure that you, uh, your house as a poor person, uh, would uh, be uh, worth much more than you can actually imagine when it was actually not worth as much as you would think. 
and it would be a form of appropriation or expropriation by uh, financial institutions. So that, as a consequence, we have a foreclosure, a for, foreclosure crisis that actually hit poor people first and extended to working class uh, middle income people. And so, uh, essentially, we see the new millennials, you know, people, you've heard these kinds of expressions about people in their 20s as being lazy, not interested in work, more interested in their, you know, before 2011 or before the crisis, more interested in, you know, just basically living. And I guess I would feel the same way if I saw my parents uh, or my elder brothers uh, working hour, you know, many hours per week and getting nothing for it, I'd probably end up in the same position. I'd say, yeah, you know, I'll just slum it for a while. And, you know, uh, at, at the same time, slumming it was pretty tough. If you think about it, uh, uh, living in uh, different uh, housing arrangements on a regular basis is a very difficult uh, uh, process. Getting educated is very difficult. You've got to pay for it. It's become commodified. Uh, even in countries that had free education. Uh, it's become commodified even uh, in the primary grades. If, you know, you go to places like Jamaica, you've got to pay for primary education uh, for your young children. If you go to the United States, um, you have the movement toward um, greater forms of charter schools, which is a form of commodifying it in some way, depending on even where you live. So for instance, if you live in a affluent neighborhood, it's more likely that you'll have a better school. So there's a certain degree to which commodifica commodification exists even within a public school system. And we certainly see that in uh, the UK and Canada with respect to the colleges and universities that have been public and are increasingly becoming privatized. As well as in that segment uh, of the uh, economy in the United States that is uh, uh, public that I see depends increasingly on the gratuities of uh, major patrons who will get their names on buildings or whatnot, or, or their names on various other kinds of uh, uh, institutions, um, even if they're owned by governments. Uh, and increasingly, they're not. So, anyway, going back to understanding uh, the the crisis of today, we see. Uh, a sense that people really have nowhere to go. And that we, uh, you know, if you really want to think about it clearly, that crisis starts much earlier than 2008. You know, the, it starts really in the 1980s and the 1990s, when affordability declines, when wages start to drop, and where people start to see their livelihoods going nowhere. Uh, yes, you had this kind of uh, hubris that people had with respect to getting rich uh, off of other people, and in fact that might have happened for uh, uh, the few and so forth. Um, and uh, so I'm setting up the reasons why people are in fact uh, be have become indignant or indignados as uh, the movement is called in Spain and Madrid and beyond. And so my work basically focuses on resistance. I, I, I do know that many people write and research and study poverty and so forth. And when I, I felt like, okay, we know that there's poverty. And so I was less interested in that than struggling against it, uh, both as a human being and also for others. And I, I thought I was pretty good at it when I was an organizer because perhaps the most exciting moments of our lives are when you, you actually organize a shop uh, with the, actually with workers, or you actually improve the lives of unemployed workers uh, through demonstrations, uh, or walking through unemployed centers, as I used to do with uh, people in Brooklyn and so forth. And that really, and this is, goes back to the early, late 1980s, early 1990s, when uh, I would do such uh, those things through the New York Unemployed Committee with uh, just a few people. You didn't need many people to do that. And that's why I think it's so, Amazing that the Greater Toronto Workers' Assembly uh, exists because it, you have a lot of activists. I, I remember talking to uh, you know, comrades and so forth, I guess I would call them that uh, then. Uh, one or two people can do a lot of damage, was the my <laughs> mantra, that you, know, you can do a lot of disruption with just a few people. You don't need a lot. Uh, and 
what really that destruction is, is really creation of new forms and creation of power uh, and empowering others to become uh, activists on their own. Uh, not becoming leaders of those people, but generating leaders on that basis. So um, today we, we see, I think, a decade of struggle. We can actually go back 11 years, but uh, I think from, for the last, since the year 2000, actually since the year 1999, since Seattle, we can see a series of struggles that have taken place major struggles that were around social forums, the creation of the WTO, the creation of NAFTA, and going back to the Zapatistas even earlier, uh, that created this notion of the anonymous person, actually, uh, who is uh, everyone. That anonymous per person is everyone. That they're, They are all leaders uh, with respect to the Zapatistas in Chiapas. Everyone was a leader uh, of the movement, and in some ways, um, uh, Sub Subcomandante Marcos actually embodied that whole notion that, you know, I don't want to be the leader, I want to be anonymous, I want the entire uh, leadership to come from below. And I think this informs the kinds of struggles that we've found in the last uh, uh, 10 to 15 years, um, starting in the Battle of Seattle in 1999, when, in fact, it was the union kicking its street. We had to bring the AFL-CIO in the United States, I guess they're also here too, um, kicking and screaming uh, to Seattle in order to protest uh, the WTO and the, and, and, and the creation of uh, uh, increasing um, uh, efforts uh, by multilateral organizations to uh, reduce uh, uh, the tariff, tariffs in various countries, but even more so the value of people's currencies in exchange and so forth. And so when you see deindustrialization in North America, Seattle becomes a very important point. Uh, and then <coughs> the subsequent year in Washington, I actually remember, some of you here that are my age, it seems like only yesterday, uh, I will remember that those were very important moments and we were all, I was a part of it and then it, 2001 or 2001, uh, in April, you had another uh, disruption, a major one here in this country, uh, in Quebec City, uh, the FTAA uh, protests. Now, that too was an example of the same kind of di division that existed between the movements, uh, syndicalists, autonomists, uh, people of different stripes who believed that unions were too cautious. Or at least, if they were not too cautious, uh, they didn't even want to participate necessarily uh, in any kind of protest that would actually have an effect on state policies and corporate policies. Without question, Quebec City in 2001 against FTAA uh, and the WTO would not have occurred without the protesters that were marching alongside. And I know that many people were critical of those people that uh, tend to be a little bit more activist uh, than others. Uh, but basically, they were not members of unions in many cases, or they were on, at the margins of the unions. Those people who were activists within unions were constrained by them. And I can say that I know many people who are, to this day, constrained by the union and say, oh, only if I were, well, when my kids graduate from college or this or that, I'll, then I'll become an activist and then, because i got to pay for their college. And, and I, I hear that story and have heard that story for the past decade or two. Um, and so what you had was, uh, again, the, the protest was about uh, the ecological questions that uh, were uh, very prevalent. It came uh, on the heels, again, of the Zapatistas a vibrant movement, uh, questions related to housing and what questions related to the way the protesters were treated. Uh, you know, so many people were arrested, uh, so many people were uh, attacked. And it also comes at an era uh, over the last decade or so where the U.S. empire is really under uh, uh, question without, you know, the United States became the singular uh, power after the end of the Soviet Union and uh, 
you know, people have different perspectives on why, whether that was a good or bad thing, depending on where you stand. Um, and it created a U.S. kind of, a, a, without question, a power that sought to have hegemony throughout the world, and uh, that hegemony would come through neoliberal reforms and a dogma and a doctrine that was almost scientific, uh, that if you don't resort to neoliberalism, if you do not resort to uh, ending uh, any kind of currency controls, uh, ending any kind of restraint on trade, any kind of uh, tariffs, etc. Uh, if you pay your workers higher wages or subsidize those workers, let's say Canadian auto workers or Canada, Canadian uh, auto workers who are selling, you know, who are producing cars, if they have health insurance and Americans don't, well, you know, that might ta be tantamount to a violation of the WTO accords. A case could be made for it, in fact because the workers are being subsidized. In fact, many of the auto com companies in the U.S. were demanding uh, back about 12, 15 years ago, the, union, the companies, not even the unions, they were demanding, well, you know, maybe we should have uh, universal uh, health care because uh, this way we won't have to compete on the basis of health care costs. Well, that didn't happen, and those, those companies had a different strategy if, uh, after all. Um, but what's so interesting about uh, uh, this is that the United States actually resorts to, uh, and, and also its uh, patrons throughout the world, uh, to a kind of uh, war uh, economy. And, you know, I, th I wonder sometimes, you know, what people will think uh, 50, 60 years, uh, maybe 70 years from now, and what they'll write about us and what we did, and what kind of era this is and was. Uh, and I think about it, and I, I I can't help but thinking that this is a wartime. At least I, I, a different type of war, but clearly the expenditures that uh, are going into the military industrial complexes of countries in the global north, particularly the United States, and I would argue, and Canada, is tremendous. And it really does uh, have a uh, deleterious effect on people's lives. Uh, so, um, I want to just take a turn here because I want to look at unions and I think that we, we need to understand them differently with respect to the ways in which they operate. And one is that I don't think we should begrudge the fact that there are some workers in unions that are doing very well. That perhaps construction workers in certain segments of, the, of North America are making $150,000 to $200,000 a year. Well, maybe that's not very well compared to uh, multimillionaires on Wall Street or speculators uh, uh, in uh, various uh, banks and financial institutions. But uh, the very fact is that they are members of unions, and if they were not uh, members of unions, they might uh, not make more than twenty or thirty thousand a year or forty thousand a year, uh, or they may be replaced by uh, uh, migrant workers who may be. Uh, working uh, at minimum or below minimum wage, and I've seen that actually happen within the construction industry with respect to asbestos removal. So I, I think that um, what has happened is that we find increasingly that organized labor is in decline, particularly in the United States. I know that there's a lot of questions about the difference between the United States and Canada, or Canada. Seymour Martin Lipset has written extensively on that subject. I don't, you know, I don't think that Canadians are more left than people in the United States, necessarily. I don't think they want unions more than people in the United States. I think that uh, perhaps the restraint on unions is greater on, in the United States. A and therefore, I think one should, just to get back to my argument, one should try to protect jobs that are high paying or paying a decent wage. Uh, they and they don't even in, union, in the United sector, sector. It's very difficult to survive even that sector in the U.S. or Canada. But we shouldn't begrudge people for getting paid a decent wage. I, I remember uh, back in the 19, early 1980s when I was in college, uh, people were saying, you know, isn't it awful? Those auto workers are making $10 an hour. I was thinking to myself, it's $10 an hour, that's uh, what, $400 a week and so forth. Uh, and and yeah, they get benefits and they get vacations and so forth. And uh, 
this per, a person who is a mother or a friend of mine, and a, a very affluent person, I was what I said, no, it doesn't, you know, you know, people deserve to be able to exist, and, uh, to live, and have a decent uh, standard of living. But increasingly, that was part of a pattern that existed of an attack against middle wage working class people. Uh, Ten dollars an hour would have been middle wage back in 1985, uh, or close to it. Maybe not exactly middle wage. Uh, today, it's you know, you may be lucky if you get a job at ten dollars an hour. Now that really tells uh, you a lot about what has happened. But it's also happened in places such as uh, uh, Europe, and I think some of the models that I'm interested in, and I think that we could learn from, is saying, okay, we should try to defend those unions that are under attack as fiercely as possible because, you know, I'm not an Alinskyite in any way, but if they attack those unions, what is going to happen to the rest of the labor uh, market, the workers in other segments of the economy? So if union workers can't make $25 an hour, non-union workers are going to barely make more than minimum wage, if that, if, get it, if they are able to get a job. And that's what's happened. That's what's leading up to these uh, protests and so forth. It's not the fact that people simply have spare time because they're unemployed. It's because people are raging uh, over the conditions in which they're facing. And the ones that uh, uh, have organized these uh, movements are just completely uh, in a, a state of uh, anger and uh, uh, resistance that I think exists and continues to this day. What form that will take is uh, a question that we should debate. Um, so I was uh, going to just uh, digress for a moment. I will digress for a moment and, and tell you about the uh, movement of the Cobas in uh, Italy during the 1980s to the present. Who, what, who are the Cobas? Uh, the Cobas are organizations uh, that are unions or working class organizations uh, that we frequently refer to as autonomous because they uh, represented uh, those people who were trying to survive in the post-Fordist economy. The economy where uh, the manufacturing uh, segment um, was uh, under deep attack, where flexibilization, uh, in other words, creating various subcontractors and so forth outside of the plant, sometimes even inside the plant, uh, took place, or inside the enterprise, or inside the airport, or inside the hospital, or inside the university. Flexibilization has taken place, which means essentially that you have within the single unit people who are working at different wages. So I, I work at 25 Broadway, which is right in front of that raging bull. People are raging mad near Raging Bull. That's probably, it's actually called the Raging Bull. Uh, I don't know if people know what it is. That's the symbol of Wall Street. It's not actually on Wall Street, but it's right on Bowling Green at the, in downtown Manhattan. And uh, in that building that I, I work in, there are people who work for 32BJ SCIU, the union of major, one of the largest unions in the United States. And there are people who work for uh, the uh, CSDA. Uh, and for the local uh, branch of it, which is called DC 37. Uh, and the wage differential is enormous. Those people who are working for uh, 32 BJ are making uh, an, on average somewhere around 50,000 a year, which, you know, in New York you really can't survive alone on. It's very difficult to survive. You probably have to live outside of the city at that wage, which is comparable to the Canadian dollar. Those people who are not working for 32 BJ and in DC 37 are lucky to make half that amount working full time because one group of people are employed by one segment of uh, the building and the other is employed by the university. So the building is a organized building by uh, the standards of uh, two different types of unions that have significantly different uh, bargaining agreements. Uh, and one is much weaker. One works for public sector, which is weaker in this case, and the other the private sector union uh, is stronger. Uh, what the COBAs represent were the same kind of process and where 
you had this flexibilization that was taking place initially at the Fiat near Forey Works in 1973, where workers started to think, you know, this is not right. We are, and they tended to be people of color, or I forgive me, people from the South. They tended to be people who were less integrated into the community, the communities and so forth, the South of Italy, and um, younger workers as well. And so they, they went on, they were extremely militant, and they went on strikes on a regular basis that were not authorized by the dominant unions, whether it was the CGIL or the uh, Catholic Workers' Union, which is pretty strong uh, in, uh, in Italy and so forth. Uh, but basically, they wanted to see a uh, reinstatement of the standard of living. They did not want to see um, what we can argue is uh, a turn within the factory both the factory of the global north and the factory of the global south. What I mean by this, particularly with respect to the global north, is that within factories preceding mass production, people tended to think of themselves as members of particular skilled and craft unions. There was a greater sense of worker autonomy. It's interesting that the same kind of language is used today when we refer to autonomous movements. The same word, autonomy, was what we referred to craft workers who were working in uh, plants throughout North America. Uh, and um, many of them were unionized uh, through unions, uh, just a plethora of different types of unions. And then all of a sudden, and I, we have to say that, you know, the kind of mass production unionization that we have uh, throughout the world is not a old form. It's fairly modern, if you think about it. It's, begins in the 1930s, more or less, and it's uh, still in existence, but it's under severe attack. But it was uh, under attack beginning in the 1970s, when there was efforts to undermine production rates uh, across and so forth. So essentially, there is a failure of trade union unity that has taken place because unions have accepted this kind of dual wage systems. Unions have not resisted the kinds of bargaining um, that allows corporations and uh, manufacturers to outsource to contractors that pay a fraction of the cost. Now, this is not just in North America. This is in, and not just in Europe. It's in Japan and Korea and other countries as well. In Korea and Japan, it's particularly outrageous where you have workers at Toyota plants making uh, a significant uh, amount of money, not a lot, but enough. Uh, and then you have people working at some of the other manufacturers or auto parts manufacturing plants, making a fraction. And uh, they tend to be actually Japanese too, but immigrant Japanese, people who are a part of the diaspora coming back home. And in Japan, they've developed a new form uh, of unionization called community unionization, which is very different from the traditional model of plant-based uh, unionization uh, that was very much uh, closely tied to the corporation. Well, what these COBAs did they were independent organizations in Italy, is that they, gave, they went on mass strikes on a regular basis. Uh, and they uh, did not just strike factories. They struck education institutions. They struck um, against privatization of education on the uh, secondary level. They struck uh, against the growth of precarious jobs. The term precariousness comes from this whole notion of uh, uh, what had been taking place in Italy for uh, the last uh, 30, 40 years. Perhaps the first country that was engaged in kinds of uh, uh, neoliberal policies in the 70s under uh, uh, the auspices of both parties, really. In that case, it would have been the Italian Communist Party, but the dominant party was the Christian Democrats at the time. Uh, and they were fighting against privatization uh, of public services, fighting uh, uh, against privatization of energy, um, tried to defend telecommunications workers, and they were telecommunication workers. They, they served every sector of the economy, and the economy was becoming fragmented, and the economy was becoming flexible, uh, uh, so that capital, <coughs> different segments of capital would get their cut. Uh, and this came to a head um, in, uh, I would argue, uh, the year uh, would be 2001 the same year that uh, we could talk about uh, with respect to um, a lot of things. 
Athens, uh, certainly Quebec City, but in 2001 you had Euro May Day. Uh, for the first time, uh, European workers you know, realized that uh, we, we don't really want to march with the traditional trade unions anymore. So you had counter marches, counter demonstrations, and they really had a major effect on the way people thought of the traditional union, that it was becoming much more exclusive, exclusionary, um, ironically, um, than in previous decades. Now we can make the differences, we can discuss the differences between craft type unions and industrial based unions. One kind is more inclusionary, they are industrial unions. Ironically, they are exclusionary when people lose their jobs. Once you're out of the union, the uh, union does not care about it in most cases, not at all. And that's actually one of the uh, issues with respect to unemployment that's so damaging. What happens to an unemployed worker if you're a carpenter or something like that, or a steel worker? The union has no obligation whatsoever to you after that's over. Maybe you have a pension or something like that, or a health plan, but over time that ends, and that has ended for most uh, industrial workers uh, in North America, in Europe at least. Um, Actually, that same year, 2001, I remember, I'll give you an anecdotal story, I was working with uh, the Lower East Side Community Labor Coalition, and we were interested in building solidarity with uh, uh, the majority of workers in our neighborhood, realizing that the majority of our, the workers in our neighborhood were, were making below minimum wage. Now, actually, this I was uh, recognized in 1996. <laughs> it happened to be Mexican uh, workers, and you know, other workers from uh, uh, Central America and uh, Mexico, and they tended to make two dollars an hour in many. In, I'm not kidding. I mean, this is I can give you the evidence of this. Two dollars an hour without benefits, working 72 hours a week. Uh, they tended to be in other neighborhoods, uh, francophone, African uh, workers from Mali, uh, Senegal. Niger and uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and they were making even less than two dollars an hour. They were making actually the equivalent of what you know somebody who drives around. They basically were delivery workers, and there were people who were stocking shelves and so forth. The union decided in a side agreement, uh, and I, I actually did not get in trouble for writing about this. Um, the union was the RWDSU Local 338 in New York uh, Region representing something like 10,000 workers, but they decided not to represent most of the workers. And they allowed the major supermarket chains in the region to subcontract the work, uh, in this case, to the most um, uh, rapacious employers uh, who operated in basements and so forth, and hired uh, francophone workers, and they depended on payment based on the tips they would get in deliveries. Sometimes they would get a dollar an hour if they worked in the store or something like that. And so our WDSU considered it a great victory in around 2000, 2001, uh, when they were able to say, hey, look, you know, you know, this is when we opened, reduced the restrictions on immigration uh, in the US. Uh, and in general, unions became uh, more interested in organizing those people who are marginal. Uh, who are working in many of the same plants. Think of Austin, Minnesota and the meatpacking strike. Uh, if you go back, and it may be true of Canada, but it's certainly in the United States, which is different. Uh, if you go to the meatpacking industries, it's no longer uh, the jungle that Upton Sinclair wrote about in his work. Uh, it's no longer Eastern European workers, and it's no longer their, their uh, sons and daughters that are working in those plants. Who are working those plants? People from Central America. How much are they getting paid? They're lucky to get paid minimum wage. Are they represented by a union? Yes, UFCW. And are they subject to deportation? Yes. And if they organize, will they be deported? Yes. It's happened over and again. And these are the kinds of uh, issues that we're referring to where people in Austin, Minnesota were able to earn uh, a decent living working in a, I think it was a pork processing uh, plant. Okay, my time is just about up. I think that we should really, I was gonna talk about the war of maneuver and the war of position based on that whole notion, but I think 2001 is a very important time to uh, uh, recognize as uh, the beginning of the struggle against the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, global capitalism, and it culminates today uh, with Occupy. The question that I think we should all bear in mind and I think we should discuss is how do we defend uh, ourselves against the capitalist onslaught, uh, one that is extremely powerful uh, against financialization, against dispossession of people's homes and so forth through for foreclosures and beyond, and how do we create new models to represent ourselves? How do we create new models that are democratically uh, motivated? And just once again, to wrap things up, I think people are highly disenchanted with uh, the uh, not just traditional unions, but also the traditional parties that we have in our countries. I know in Canada there was an effort to create a new party in the last 20 years, which is more interesting than in the United States, the New Democrats. Uh, but everybody has actually come to the neoliberal dogma, so it really doesn't make a difference who's in power. Uh, and a lot of people, a lot of young people, a lot of those people who uh, can't even uh, afford to pay their rent, unless they live with five or six other people, and even then have a hard time. Uh, and these are not a small number of people. We're talking about tens, hundreds of thousands, millions, perhaps, people. Uh, who cannot afford to live outside of their parents' homes and so forth, uh, who may have voted for Obama, President Obama in 2008, uh, what are they going to do? Where are they, what, what is the future that they have? And, and, uh, I think they do have a very powerful future in transforming the world. Anyway, I, I think this, is, this should be more of a discussion than I probably talk too much, so please forgive me, and thank you very much for having me. And so I hope that perhaps opens up part of a uh, debate on the subject. Thank you very much.